Hello. Ooh. Oh, wait. There we go. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for coming out, um, especially those who have come out in this uh, blustery weather. Thank you for joining us. Um, first, some brief housekeeping and then on to tonight's um, main event. So tonight's format will be a discussion for 45 to 50 minutes and then a Q&A for the remainder of the time until the top of the hour at 8 and then a book signing at the red table uh, after that. Um, we have a plethora of January and February programs. Um, this is our first one of the new year, but we also have Aisha Roscoe coming up, Michelle Norris, our yearly book lovers breakfast, the first Saturday of February, and then Etta Fields Black at the end of February as well. So if any of those of interest or if all of them are of interest, please join us. And then tonight's event is also co-sponsored by the Jewish uh, by the Jewish Museum of Maryland. Um, thank you, thank you. And so now for tonight's main event. Tonight, I'm happy to welcome Matilda Bernstein Sycamore to the Pratt Library to discuss her book, Touching the Art. A mixture of memoir, biography, criticism, and social history, Touching the Art 
is queer icon and activist Matilda's interrogation of the possibilities of artistic striving, the limits of the middle class mindset, the legacy of familial abandonment, and what and what art can and cannot do. Matilda Bernstein Sycamore is the author of The Freezer Door, a New York Times editor's choice, uh, one of Oprah Magazine's best LGBTQ books of 2020, and a finalist for the Penn slash Jean Stein Choi uh, Book Award. She's the author of three novels and three nonfiction titles, and the editor of six nonfiction anthologies, most recently, Between Certain Death and a Possible Future, Queer Writing on Growing Up and the AIDS Crisis. Author Catherine Lacey said, Matilda Bernstein Sycamore braids humor, tragedy, and unabashed presence in every single sentence she writes. With touching the art, she blends history, essay, and memoir, telling her own secrets and truths through the lives of others. I adore Sycamore's writing and would follow her anywhere. Nobody touches the art like Sycamore. Sarah Nielsen from the Seattle Times says, Sycamore creates a mosaic of art and humanity, flaws and all. And finally, in Kirkus Reviews, they wrote, Touching the Art is full of frank, intimate reflections on art, life, and their often complex intersections. It is my great pleasure to welcome Matilda Bernstein Sycamore to the Pratt Library. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out in the rainstorm. Um, I appreciate it. Um, let me see. Let's, let's, is it OK to close this computer? Or will that close the? We'll close that. OK, so I'll just put, it's OK to put the book on top of that. OK, great. Um, well, it's funny. So I live in Seattle. You know, when, you, when it's raining, you go outside. It's the only way you can survive. So today, I thought, Oh, I'm going to go on that, this really nice walk I remember from when I was doing research here and living in Baltimore in 2018. And the walk goes sort of through Wyman Park into the Hopkins campus, around, you know, down this like where you scenic overlook where you can see the creek. And then you go like down into the woods and then over this little bridge and then through a field. And then on the other side, you can get to Mom's Organic Grocery, which was my big destination. Um, so, and also, I remember loving when the creek floods and it gets this huge river, right? So I went down there, um, got soaked. i wearing a wool coat. My wool coat now weighs like five pounds more than it weighed before. Um, but it cleared my head, right? And the rain, you know, clears your head. And, um, and it was beautiful to see all of that um, life, right? Um, so... Yeah, so thanks so much uh, to the Enoch Pratt Free Library for bringing me here tonight and to the Jewish Museum of Maryland for co-sponsoring this event. Um, the book centers around my relationship with my late grandmother, Gladys Goldstein, who was an abstract painter from Baltimore. So the book is centrally about Baltimore um, in many different ways. And so I thought I would um, start by reading from near the beginning of the book. And then I thought I'd maybe talk a little bit about the process of writing the book and then um, maybe read a little more. Then we'll have time for questions and conversation. Um, and afterwards, I'll be signing uh, copies of the book, of course. Um, so great. Um, oh, and thanks to everyone who's joining from the live stream, too, um, who couldn't make it in the rain. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to read from about 10 pages in. If the self is always a collaborative project, Gladys gave me what I needed as a child. This I know. What changed as I came into myself is one of the things I'm trying to figure out. How it changed. And why? Because if I look at these pictures Gladys took of me when I was 19, I can see the way we're collaborating. I remember her commenting on my hair, how she thought it was interesting, 
She liked my earrings, except the largest one that was like a horn. And in the photo where she asked me to reach my hands up against the wall from behind with my shirt off, the emphasis goes to my thumbnails painted black and the bracelets around my bare arms. We are making art together with my body. The dynamic between thinking about art and creating it, experiencing art in the everyday, like you're walking down the street and you look up at the way the light hits those vines that cover the side of that building. Or when the vines start to change color, reds and greens and browns. Or when you go back by that building one night and you look up and the vines are gone. And now all you can see are the marks in the paint where they once were. Which one of these means the most depends on what you're looking for. The way there's the art and its history. And then there's Gladys's history in creating the art. And then there's my history in witnessing and imagining her creation. And then there's my history of writing about Gladys. I'm thinking about Pulling Tappy, my first novel. Here it is on the bookshelf right next to my desk. I open it up with Gladys's art on the walls above. In the book, I changed her name to Rose Stern because she loved flowers, because she was stern, not to me as a child, but later. To the world? When my father was in college, he decided he wanted to be a writer. But when he announced this to Gladys, she said simply, then you support yourself. So he decided to go to medical school instead. Gladys told this anecdote proudly over and over. I don't believe it though, not exactly. I mean, I believe she meant this as a threat, but also I believe he wasn't brave enough to reject her. I mean, he wasn't brave enough to reject the world. And she knew this. Does this make her threat more cruel or less. If art is a gap in feeling, it's also a feeling of the gap. When I asked Gladys how she saw herself in the context of 20th century art, she said, I'm much better than Jackson Pollock. I'm not as good as Mark Rothko because he did something different. I'm like Richard Diebenkorn, only maybe he was a better painter but there are things I can do that I don't think anyone else can. So you see, she wasn't modest. She compared herself to the famous men of her generation. Why not? Women weren't allowed in that hallowed realm anyway, not in the public record. Unlike these famous men, Gladys did not gain national prominence. She did not influence generations of artists around the world. Her work is not widely acclaimed like theirs, and she barely exists now in official memory, even in Baltimore. But there are things I can do that I don't think anyone else can. Isn't this the goal of every artist? how Gladys would pick up a leaf from the street and ask me what I saw. And we could marvel at this together. Every leaf, another pattern undoing the pattern. Color as a way of experiencing the brightness of feeling. And yet, I see her cruelty when she said to her only child, who was telling her he wanted to pursue a creative life, then you support yourself. I see Gladys's cruelty, but I also see it as a dare. Later, my father did write books about psychiatry. I've never read those books, but after I remembered that my father sexually abused me, I went to a therapist who asked if it was okay to read one of my father's books so he could understand him. 
this seems strange to me. But I said, sure. And then that therapist came back the next session and said he didn't think it was possible that my father could have sexually abused me because the book was so rational. The falling apart and coming together, the rupture and fusion, to see it all in this contained space, how the arrangement of color and pattern and texture creates so much emotion. To contain it and let it go, you hold it up close, and suddenly you see the hills and valleys far away, and the shapes become clearer. But did that therapist say rational or logical? If you have logic on your side, you have everything. So maybe my father had everything. In Pulling Taffy, I write, it's his eyes I remember. When he took off his glasses, I'd scream. Like in Rose's portrait of him, I fell in. In Rose's house, the paintings sing. The critics say, catapult. Am I the critics now? Every paperwork, a new discovery. This one in simple primary colors, red, yellow, and blue on white. Four straw pieces, pulled from a decaying placemat that I remember, forming a broken and open square inside the white square of the paperwork itself, and crossing the colored squares underneath the white inside the larger square. It's almost like a Mondrian, actually. Did she mean it to be in dialogue with his work, or is this something the critics say? Mondrian was one of the artists that never moved me. I knew he was supposed to be great, but I didn't know why. I would see his work in museums or on postcards, but it all looked the same. So when Gladys told me he was the artist that impacted her the most, I was confused. Then Gladys said, Mondrian taught her how to paint white. Or did she say he taught her how to see white. And I hadn't even thought about the white in those paintings. I was just looking at the patterns. How white is always a relationship to what's around it, but also how white is composed of what comes through, not an absence, but a presence. You stand up and look inside one of these silver almost squares, a frame inside the frame. And there's a whole other work of art there, a complete world of movement and stasis, pleasure and softness, darkness and light. Contained in almost all my paintings, Gladys says, there are three or four other paintings that I'm wasting. And in this painting, there are more than three or four. The more I look at it, the more I find. When you have a relationship with a piece of art, there's loyalty involved, but there's also a depth of feeling. The way it shifts every time you look, circle over circle over circle, but then you get closer and each circle isn't a circle at all. The geometry of art created by the frame the geometry inside the frame, but also art as the undoing of geometry. It's not just Gladys's paintings that contain multiple works inside them, but her paperworks and collages, no matter how small. Maybe it's the accumulation that allows the composition to flow. If you look very closely at this candy wrapper collage, you can still see the word ingredient. Gladys wanted the ingredients to show. She was not in search of perfection, but the perfection of letting imperfection show. This was a skill she cultivated. In Gladys's art, 
there are always so many places to focus your attention. I can disappear into this world of her creation, reappear in a different shape. Even just looking at her signature in the bottom right corner, gold on black, and where are all these specks of gold inside the black coming from? And how did she make handmade paper look like paint, as if it's splattering? Maybe she splattered the wet pulp on like paint and then pressed it down? With handmade paper, the hands are always there. Paper emulating feeling. I can hold this paperwork up to the light, put it on a table under the light, or place it on a box on the floor. And I still can't figure out how she did everything. Art is always a mystery, even when it's not a mystery. How it affects us, or fails to. How we fail. How art fails us. I don't know if she got up in the morning and said, this is what I need to do. Or if she got up in the morning and said, this is what I need. I don't know if I need to know, but I know that I need. I picture her climbing those steep stairs during the last weeks of her life. After she fell and broke her hip, her hand, her wrist, her finger. I mean, she kept falling. Still, against everyone's advice, she climbed the stairs so she could make more candy wrapper collages. She had already made hundreds of them. What else was she trying to convey that she hadn't already conveyed? Or was making art simply the process of living? Thank you. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about the process um, of writing the book. Um, but first, actually, so one thing I love about the cover of the book is this is these are parts of her candy wrapper collages that have been cut up. And the title like comes from within it, or you know, and on them you can see the ingredients. <laughs> so like, if you look close, you can see like part of the word truffle, or here's a Hershey. Here's um, if you have questions, or just like pieces of this, like you know the warning label at the bottom. If you know you get sick, you can call this one eight hundred number. Um, and and so I love that in touching the book, it is in many ways like touching. And so the, the way that I wrote this book was I started by literally touching her art. Um, and I wanted to write on the terms of the art. And, and, and she made abstract art. And so I wanted to start by writing abstractly. And, but at the same time, of course, I was touching the art, right? And so what could be more concrete than touch? And so it's those two things that exist side by side and that I think are in conversation with one another throughout the book. So at first I'm just, you know, I'm touching the art and I'm, you know, so what some of what comes through is memories of seeing her make the art, right? So I see these handmade paperworks and there's like a wind chime, a piece of a seashell wind chime, you know, embedded in one of them. I remember when that wind chime broke and she said, oh, I should put this in my paperwork, you know, or I see different patterns. And I remember when we went downtown to the store that she, downtown Baltimore, to the store she called the Button Factory, um, which was, that you could, they would sell buttons. You could get like a bag of them for a dollar. And I would like, I was like marvel at just like one or two buttons and couldn't decide like, how can I get a bag if, you know, this pink one, I, you know, or this, this, you know, brass filigree. Um, and so, so some of it is those memories. And then some of it is about my memories of being in her studio in Mount Washington and going up to her studio was sort of the one place that I could dream as a child. And I could imagine a creative life because I was living it with her. And so there's those moments of childhood formation. And then there are the moments about the, you know, the trauma of being sexually abused by my father. And when that starts coming into the book, I've written that about that in almost every one of my books. But when it starts coming in the book, I'm like, oh no, I don't really want this here because I'm writing about this other 
you know, experience, right? Of possibility, right? And, um, but of course, that doesn't, couldn't exist without the trauma, you know, because my father is the bridge between us, right? We would never have met otherwise. And, um, and then there's the trauma of um, her abandoning me, you know, like when I was sort of coming into my own, like as a child, she sort of nourished everything that made me different. So my femininity, my introspection, my creativity, my uh, empathy, my softness, um, everything that made me queer, essentially, she nourished. As an adult, when my work became queer and my life, you know, then suddenly was vulgar. And that was the word she would use over and over again. Everything was vulgar. Why are you wasting your talent? And um, that, that was basically the refrain of like 15 years, you know, and... So, and that is the moment of like when I was 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, that's the moment. And, and so as I'm writing the book, or as I'm actually at the beginning, I'm just writing what comes through the art, right? Then I realized, oh, I have letters that she wrote that we exchanged during that exact moment. And so like when I confronted my father about sexually abusing me when I was 21, I have the letters that she wrote to me. And I have the letters I sent her too, because at that time in my life, because I had blocked everything out. I didn't want to forget anything anymore. And so that comes into the book. Then I, you know, so it sort of starts with the art and then moves into like my own archive that I didn't realize was an archive, but here it is, right? And, and so I spent like probably several hundred pages writing just that writing that was coming through the art. And now, of course, in the book, it's not several hundred pages. You know, it's maybe 40 or something. But that's the material that starts it. And the way... For me, the, the sort of editing process, in some ways, is very much like a, a visual work of art, right? Is where you're you're cutting and you're moving and you're you know trimming and you're moving things around. But I want the seams to remain, and so the book contains like that aspect as well. Um, and then after after doing that that writing for for a while, and really the other thing I wanted to do is I I wanted to figure out a method for writing about the art, um, you know uh, that that was based in the feeling of it itself, right? And so, um, and that takes a lot of writing to get there because, you know, abstract art, you can write about it really directly and you could maybe take one piece and write for 20 pages about it if you want it, but it doesn't necessarily tell you about the piece or at least about the feeling of the piece, right? And so, so for me, a lot of that was to figure out that method, right? And, and then I realized, okay, well, Baltimore is the city that formed her. You know, she was born in 1917 in Ohio. In 1919, when she's two, she moved here with her parents. And she lived here from 1919 until 2010. And so I thought, well, I have to go to Baltimore to feel what will come through. And all my writing in some ways is place-based. Usually I'm writing about the places where I've lived or the places where I'm currently living. Um, but I actually have not, had not at that point lived in Baltimore. I grew up in D.C. I would come to Baltimore um, to go to Gladys's house. I was also forced uh, to go to Baltimore Orioles games with my father as a child. So we would go to maybe like six of those a year as a sort of like male bonding ritual with his childhood best friend and his son. Um, so I knew that experience. I knew like going to the Baltimore Aquarium or Harbor Place or, you know, things like that. But the, but the rest of Baltimore did not have, or going to galleries on Charles Street. Um, but the rest of Baltimore didn't have that much of an experience. So in 2018, I moved to Baltimore for about eight months. Um, and part of that was to do, to, you know, trace things that were directly about Gladys. Um, like to go to her house, well, to go to her neighbor's house, rather, um, to talk to her neighbors, to talk to her students, people who knew her, um, to go to the Baltimore Museum of Art, where there's an archive of her um, press clippings that she kept from the 50s through the 70s. They have like a very large painting of hers um, in the vault, you know, a few other works um, to look at works by her best friend, who was Keith Martin, who was an artist that was very important to her, um, her career. And, and then some of it, you know, go to the Jewish Museum of Maryland. They have an oral history with her. Um, but then some of it was just like, what would happen to me that would touch me and that would change the work? Um, and one of the things that, that happened very fast was noticing how um, directly artists are used as tools of gentrification in Baltimore. And now this is true in most cities, 
you know, in the country. But in Baltimore, it's it's very top down. So there's like the the place where I noticed it at first was um, Station North. You know, the declaration to, you know, the name itself, right? Like, it's like, this is an arts district, right? And I, I you know, I, I was here in the summer. Well, I was here for eight months. Part of that was the summer. And I was like, how do I survive? Oh, I'm going to go to the movies. <laughs> um, so I went to the Parkway. And, you know, I go in, you go in that theater. And it's not like a typical theater that's been renovated, you know, where you, um, you're like, oh, they saved this old theater. It's, you know, gutted. And... But you walk, at least for me, I walk in, I'm like, architect, right? That's the first thing I think. And I'm like, where the hell did they get this money, right? So I look it up. You know, it's $18 million, uh, $5 million, it's from a Greek foundation. And so you have $18 million for this um, theater, which is a great place. I love going there. But in a neighborhood which is still, you know, lacking basic resources, right? And where just across the street, you can see Black people nodding off due to, like, decades of structural disinvestment, right? It's the, it's not like a, the legacy is right there. And there's, you know, at least five or six other institutions like that, you know, in, um, just in that one neighborhood, right? But it's, and so, so that way of touching the art becomes part of the book. Um, and then I, I talk, I ended up talking to, um, Gladys's childhood best friend, um, who was 101 at the time. And she, um, they were, you know, the same, if Gladys had been alive, she would have been 101. And she had all this information that I would have not have access to otherwise. And so I was also trying to sort of trace where Gladys had lived, you know, because when I asked her, um, I mean, she lived in Mount Washington, you know, uh, from 1964 until the end of her life. Um, but she grew up in Baltimore, right? And so I had asked her, do you, do you ever go to the neighborhood, back to the neighborhood where you grew up? And she said, um, you can't. Um, and I said, oh, well, uh, what do you mean? Does it not exist anymore? And she said, you can't. And I knew what she meant, right? I knew that she meant that it had become a black neighborhood and that because it was a black neighborhood, you know, her racism and the segregated mentality of Baltimore prevented her from ever going back, right? And so that legacy comes into the book, you know? And, and I do find the, the, the house where she grew up. Um, or the street where she grew up at first. It was just the street, and then much later, I figured out the exact house. Um, and, um, and also, I, found, I went to the house where she raised my father, which was, and so her trajectory was um, typical of Baltimore um, and of Jewish assimilation in Baltimore, which is the, the trajectory of white flight, right? So she grew up, um, and this is actually, in this moment, when I figure out, you know, I'm going to the street, I'm trying to find the house because her father worked at the AMP. So I'm trying to find this AMP that's supposedly right there. And, but this neighborhood, McKean Avenue, is where she grew up. And it's, you know, a very typical neighborhood in Baltimore that has been destroyed, you know, by structural violence, you know, and decades of disinvestment. And um, so, like, half the buildings are boarded up, you know, um, there are very few businesses that are open every few blocks. There'll be one really nice house. And you're like, oh, what's this? It's the liquor store, of course, you know. And um, the most active, you know, trade is the drug trade, if there, you know, is an active trade. Or maybe it's, uh, on one corner there might be um, snowballs and sneakers, right? And, um, and so, and I'm, so I'm thinking about, okay, what is, you know, thinking about this neighborhood. And then I realized that Freddie Gray was murdered five blocks from where she grew up, right? And so that's, the legacy, right? And um, and then I go to the neighborhood where she raised my father, which is Howard Park, and um, and this is a, a very intact, you know, middle class uh, neighborhood with beautiful houses and big trees, and and I think well, the only thing that's different about this is the houses are older and the trees are bigger, and everyone in the neighborhood is black, you know. And to her though, she didn't go back to either of the neighborhoods, you know. I don't know if she knew the difference, you know. And, and so I'm thinking about that legacy, right? The legacy of Jewish assimilation and white flight and structural violence and disinvestment and hyper-policing. And um, so all of that comes into the book. And then I realized the, where she grew up was, it was right on the dividing line, uh, the legal dividing line of segregation in Baltimore, right? So she was just one block west, the Fulton Avenue line, and a couple blocks north of North Avenue. And so... 
you know, she grew up under strict legal segregation. Now, of course, Baltimore is still segregated, right? But this is legal segregation, right? Where, you know, schools are segregated, where housing, um, where uh, stores, parks, um, almost every aspect of Baltimore, you know, was segregated legally. And so I'm trying to think, well, what, 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 what did that feel like? You know, what was that? I don't, I can't figure out, did she cross those lines or not? You know, but I can, and so I realized, well, Billie Holiday is essentially an exact contemporary of hers. And she grew up in Baltimore, which I hadn't known before, and until she was about 13 or 14. And so I started reading all these books about Billie Holiday. I read her memoir. Um, and, and, you know, Billie Holiday is an abstract artist, right? Jazz is abstract art. And so I'm reading, and, and she in her memoir is like scathing right, about Baltimore like about the racism that she encountered her entire career, whether it's like North, South, East, West, but especially about Baltimore. And she has this line where she says, um, in Baltimore, the whorehouse was the only place where white and black people could interact in any natural way. And I was like, oh, that's the, that's, that is it right there. You know what I mean? And so, so Billie Holiday comes into the book. And so the book sort of forms from these absences or gaps or silences, and then the sort of exploration of how they come together in a certain way. And, um, and then after, after that process, then I start doing more like what would be traditionally considered research. You know? So I start looking at the women of abstract expressionism, which is essentially her generation. Now she didn't, um, think of herself as an abstract expressionist, but if she had been commodified, then she would be, right? Because abstract expressionism is this huge range of artists that, you know, if you look at a Rothko or something, or an Pollock, they don't look, there's not a similarity. It's that they've been commodified, you know? And, and there's this moment now where the women are being commodified. Now they were silenced, they were pushed to the margins. They made them in many cases, like, you know, um, Lee Krasner ha had her own career in the 30s, um, and then met this man, Jackson Pollock, and she's like, oh, he's the girl. I'm going to make this great. You know? And for Elaine Kooning, met this artist, you know, um, uh, what's his first name? <laughs> Willem de Kooning. And, um, and she became a critic in part so she could validate his career, right? And, and so, um, but now the women are being commodified, of course, way after they're dead. Um, but, so the, but there is the scholarship about the life. So I start with this book, Nine Three Women by Mary Gabriel. And she's writing about five of these women. So Lee Krasner, um, Elaine de Kooning, um, Helen Frankenthaler, uh, Joan Mitchell, and Grace Hardigan. And now Grace Hardigan is very interesting to me because the book starts with her. Grace Hardigan is famous in Baltimore, right? She is a Baltimore artist. Now she became famous first and then moved here. That's how it happened. But she lived here from 1960 until her death, so, or which was in 2008. And whenever I talked to anyone um, who had known Gladys, and I asked them, oh, did Gladys ever mention um, other artists in Baltimore? And they couldn't remember. But then if there was an anecdote three or four times, it was something about Grace Hardigan. And, and, so, and it was always scathing, like completely scathing, something Gladys said about her. So I thought, oh, well, that's a, what's that story, right? And so I look up. So Grace Hardigan is famous for teaching at the Maryland Institute College of Art. She's the most famous person. And she sort of towers over the institution. And, um, and Gladys was the first person hired, one of the two first people hired to teach abstract painting there. So it was a moment of transition. So, you know, the Maryland Institute was a super conservative institution. In the 60s, they had this new president. He's like, I'm going to bring abstract art there. Now, this is very controversial. There were like articles like denouncing it. You're tagging down the Maryland Institute, right? And Gladys had gone to the Maryland Institute since she was 12. Um, they had a, a program for young artists. And, but she, when she went there um, for, uh, after she graduated high school um, to get a degree, she left because she thought it was too conservative. And the way she says it is they, she realized that they had not told her about Picasso. So that was her way of, of saying it. So she had to leave. Um, but, um, and so, so, oh, and so I'm looking at Grace Hardigan. And um, so here's this person who has been documented, right? So Gladys's legacy has not been documented that way. 
but I can look at her life to think about God. And I can think about a relationship that they had through their potential dislike of one another, you know, and, and also perhaps potential admiration, right? And so, so Gladys taught at the Maryland Institute, at Micah, um, in 1960. She left in 1964. So I look up, okay, when did Grace? Grace was hired in 1964. So I'm like, oh, well, this is interesting. Did she leave because of that, right? And then, you know, they, they had opposite teaching styles. You know, Grace liked to, like, tear people to shreds. Gladys wanted to sort of nourish their um, differences. And so I thought, well, what if they had taught at the same time? They did not. But I start to like imagine this, right? What if they had decided instead of, you know, their women of their generation um, thought nothing of women artists. Like women artists did not matter. Only the men mattered, right? So the only thing they could do with women is discard them, you know? Like, and, but what if that hadn't been true? What if they had seen each other's contradictions? Now, Grace said that she, her artist statement says she embraced everything that was vulgar and vital about American life. So I thought about that word, right? That was the word that Gladys used to dismiss me, right? Everything about me was vulgar, right? And so, oh, is this a generational question, right? And then Grace's best friend was Frank O'Hara, um, who, the famous like, gay poet of the New York School, and Gladys's best friend was Keith Martin, a gay artist in Baltimore. So I think about their relationship to think about Gladys's relationship. And so the book kind of, um, and then, you know, I, um, yeah, so these are some of the, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, but basically, you know, I'm thinking about legacy um, and about intimacy and about this creative impulse, right? And like what art can and cannot do. And so I think to Gladys and I think many artists and certainly museums, still art is something pure, right? You can't touch it. Like if you touch it, you might damage it. Right? It might not be valuable anymore, right? If it's not valuable, then it, then what is it, right? So. But what if you do, you know, and so to me, touching the art means literally touching the art, which is how I start the book, but it also means like we can't think of art as something pure, as something that exists like outside of our realm. Um, so we have to talk about like structural racism, right? Or like Jewish assimilation and white flight or about um, disinvestment or this continuing legacy of segregation in Baltimore, you know, or about, um, like my own experience being sexually abused by my father or like all of that is contained within, right? Even if I still can look at Gladys's art and find that sort of childlike excitement and that sense of possibility that she gave me as a child. Even if, like, you know, she taught me that art meant everything, right? That nothing else mattered. And that was how she lived her life, is what she said. But I learned, of course, that's not true, right? Like she actually believed in middle-class respectability um, as much as that her art she made within middle-class respectability. To me, as a child, I thought she was rejecting it, right? Because I thought an artist meant you had to reject all of that, right? And, and so I placed all this side by side, right? And, um, and I think that the, I think the thing that's the most, in some ways, paradoxical, right, is learning all of this and knowing all of this, including, you know, the, like, racism, classism, misogyny, you know, homophobia, all of it, I still, the art to me becomes more present, you know, or I become more present um, within and alongside and together with it. Um, so, yeah, so why don't I just read, I'm going to read one other little section, and then, then we'll go to questions. Um, I think I'll read a section that, um, there are parts of the book where they sort of, the book opens up in a sense where the writing um, becomes more spare. So there'll just be like one paragraph on the page. I'm gonna read it and some of these things sort of sit alongside one another. Um, so I think I'm gonna read just one of those little, I think we'll just read a little bit. Um, see. Okay. My mother just reminded me of something. She said, my father would never go up into Gladys's studio. She always wanted him to come up, but he refused. 
He told my mother it was because Gladys was too sensitive about his feedback. I have no idea whether this was true. But now I realize that's another reason why going into her studio must have felt like a dream. Because I didn't have to worry that he would invade. Is Gladys already in the room when I enter? Or does she come in after? In any case, I'm surprised to see her. She's sitting on the floor in painter's clothes. Maybe not her usual clothes, but someone's. And she says, as a kid, I painted with Lacey. Lacey, I ask. And she says, call up Russell and ask. And I realize she means Russell paint. Lacey must be a color. Wait a second, I say. I need to get some paper to take notes. And I go to my desk, but how many sheets do I need? I decide on three, and then I'm back in the room with Gladys. And she says, are Marvin and Eric going to read it? Or maybe she says, Marvin and Erica. Gladys, I say, they're not around. I don't want to say dead, because what is she? And she says, you can join me. Now she's wearing a red jumpsuit with a cinched waist. No, I can't, I say, and she slowly fades away. Outside, the loud slam of the garbage truck wakes me up. But I want to bring Gladys back. I need to have a list of questions ready for next time. I think about how the red of her jumpsuit was close to the orange of the prison uniform, how in this dream I said I wasn't going to kill myself, and has this ever been so direct? When someone asks, what is your writing process? I think it must be to try and try. And then finally, in the gap between the limits of my body and the possibility of pulling something through somewhere in that gap. I thought it was a really daring step of you to write a book about women only, says Deborah Solomon, in conversation with Mary Gabriel at the Whitney. And yet, Ninth Street women spent so much time on the influence of all the famous men in these women's lives. But maybe this is unavoidable when depicting the time in which these women emerged as artists. When to claim the category of woman and artist would mean dooming oneself to further obscurity. Not either or, but all together, is how Gabriel describes her approach. How, as the art world solidified into the art market, women were pushed out. I want to read a biography of all these women artists without any mention of the men who dominated their lives. I want these men to disappear. But then, I guess that wouldn't be a biography. It would be an exorcism. But then Mary Gabriel says, abstract painting was a language that transcended gender. Sometimes we know what inspires us, and sometimes we don't. But there's always something when we're inspired. And it doesn't just come from inside. It can't. Maybe that's why we are alive. I'm thinking about Billie Holiday's mother, trying to keep her away from men. She was fine with her sleeping with women, but she thought the men would destroy her. Unfortunately, she was right. If you watch Jackson Pollock 51, the 10 minute film where Pollock paints a student as a class, using brushes and sticks and cans, smoking the whole time, and posing with the wildness of the so called American landscape. Just after the halfway mark of the film, when Pollock is finishing the process of tacking the new canvas on the wall of his studio, you can see Lee Krasner from the back, her hair freshly coiffed, wearing all black with her hands clasped behind her. Is Krasner a prop or a model? She's in the corner between the black wall and the white wall, the long, skinny horizontal painting and the long, skinny vertical one. As the camera pans slowly from right to left with dramatic classical music, as if we are in suspense, there's Krasner head tilted slightly to the left, gazing at the edge of the canvas. What does 
she see there? Joan Mitchell. I don't have any feeling for monumental art, except what they want me to feel is that I don't exist. And that's okay. Marianne Kajori. That's okay. Joan Mitchell. Sure. I don't want to exist in their way. Thank you. So now, any questions you have, just let me know. I love all questions. I'm going to drink some water. <laughs> it's warm in here, right? I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Uh, let's see, what questions did you have? Did you have one? Take your time. Mm. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, yes. Um, I mean, I've written in different ways. Um, I mean, this book is interesting because it wasn't until Gladys died in 2010, and I went to her studio, her, which was in her house in Mount Washington, and I had a chance to like spend time with her art and with her, her garden and her mineral collection and you know everything in going to her studio and being in the space and then so much to me. Um, that was, and that then I had this realization. This is way before I took the book, but then I had this realization, like. Um, how much it would have meant to me if she had engaged with my work as an artist. So she was like the, the one person in my family who could and she refused to. And when she died, I realized, of course, that would never happen. And that was when I realized I missed her. And I couldn't have written this book while she were alive because I wouldn't have realized I missed her, you know, because it would have, it was just that judgmental. You know, like I call her up on the phone. And she's like, "What are you up to?" I'm like, "Oh, I went to acupuncture. Oh, that's gonna kill you." Um, or like, "Oh, okay. Well, what have you been doing lately?" Oh, I went to yoga. Oh, I broke my, you know, neck when I, you know, went to yoga. Blah, blah, blah. So, um, and you know, she did. I would go to her studio, and she would ask me about her, what I thought of her art, and um, and she valued my critique of her. Art. Like, I remember this one time, you know, I was looking at a painting and I thought, oh, well, what do you think? Is this blue taking too much attention? And she's like, oh, no, no, no. So then she called me up like a month later and she said, oh, I took it out, you know? And so, so she valued my critique of her work, but, but would not refuse to engage in my work at all. And, um, but I think, but I've always written, I think because uh, in different ways, you know, about, um, because I think when I remembered I was sexually abused by my father, um, which was when I was 19, that's when I remembered. And before that, I had blocked it out of my life, and it came out, you know, in the context of my first um, sexual relationship, you know, and and I, you know, started, um, you know, having essentially flashbacks, you know, like in the moment of touch, right, and connection. And um, I was lucky enough that. My boyfriend at that time, who was also 19, had already had a relationship with someone who's an incest survivor. And, and, and also was in a world of like queer kids who had all like fled their places of origin, you know? And, um, and like we were all trying to survive and many of us were incest survivors. And so, um, and so for me, writing that, was survival, like I had to write it, you know? And I think, um, and so my writing, I think I've always, um, it had to be on my terms in that sense. And so I couldn't think about, um, I guess it's the only way I could exist, right? And I still feel that way in a lot of ways. Like I think that writing is what has kept me alive, you know? And it's, writing into the gaps, writing into the complications, writing into the trauma, going toward it, not away from it, you know? And, and I think also over the years, it is also what's brought me closer to the thing, you know, by writing into that vulnerability, by writing the thing, and it happens all the time where it's like, oh, if I say this, I'm gonna die. 
and then I write it and I don't die, you know? And so that brings me closer, right? And also brings me closer myself. And so I think for me, um, it's always been a necessity. Thank you. Yes. Totally. Yeah, I mean, yes, I was living in Seattle at that time. Uh, 2018 was when I was here. And um, I mean, honestly, um, yeah, it's, I think, let me think about that a second. I think, I mean, Seattle is a, is a hyper gentrified, extremely middle class city, um, middle class in the town, so that even countercultural Seattle is still middle class, essentially. And, um, the thing I, and that's the thing I just like the most about this, is that mentality. Not, and by middle class, I don't mean the comfort, because it's beyond that, unfortunately. It used to be comfortable, but now it's, it's too expensive to live, you know? So the comfort of middle class is no longer there, right? And, but that mentality, of this gated mentality, right? You run into people on the street, and they look at you with a white picket fence in their eyes, right? You run into people you know, and they look over here. <laughs> so there's a coldness, there's a total, and it's tech. It's a tech mentality. People say it's Nordic heritage, which is statistically like 5% of the people, you know. And there are more Jews in Seattle than Nordic heritage, right? And so, but people don't say, oh, it's Jewish, right? It's like, so it's this idea, um, yeah, it's this gated mentality. And I think being here in Baltimore, the one thing I immediately appreciated is that on the street, people are much more direct. People will engage with you. Now, half of it, is negative and half of it is positive. I mean, just making up percentages. And actually, this comes out in the book a lot with me walking down the street. Like one time, I'm walking down the street and there's um, someone just naked walking down the street. And I'm like, what are you up to? And, and um, you know, and this person, he's like, I don't know. And he, I was like, you know, I can't I don't remember I, if I said, do you want a hug? And then so I give him a hug. So things like that. And also just walking down the street and people like commenting on, you know, like, um, you know, let's like, you know, just typical, like either homophobic or like transphobic or, you know, but also with love sometimes, right? It's, it goes both ways, right? Be like, girl, you work, you know, like, walk the work on the street, come on, you know, that's what I love, you know, and sometimes there's a violence to it too. You know, I remember like I was here just walking down Charles, I think it was like, there is like a, at that point, there was like some sort of like, Thing, you know, uh, like downtown, uh, not downtown, it's more like, a, yeah, like, I don't know if it still takes place there, where the, the dancing just happened in the street, and it was actually very mixed, you know, like, in a way that in Seattle would not be like that, right? And so it's this interesting, this, I think this complicated thing where Baltimore is intensely segregated, like, everyone knows that, right? Intensely, and you feel it all the time. But there's this strength, you know, like um, in neighborhoods that are gentrifying, actually, for the most part, where there is this cross-class, cross-race contact that doesn't necessarily happen in other places. And that also is something I write about in the book. And it's not necessarily comfortable, you know, but it's always happening, you know. And, um, or even like, let's say on Charles, you know, there's like a couple blocks where there are like tons of trans women around who live in some of the houses, who are like working the street or selling drugs or, you know, so that, that liveliness in, but, it, but at the same time as it's being um, pushed out. So it's like both simultaneously. And the, the thing with the, this notion, these arts districts, right? Like other cities, that happens after the fact, right? It's just, the deal is theater in a sort of way. It's like, let's say New York is the most obvious example where it's like, oh, like artists move to a particular area. Now it starts at the top, right, with disinfectant, right? That creates the blight that then creates the possibility for real estate speculators to grow, right? But like 
but also part of that process is like, you know, people, artists moving to a neighborhood, like white artists in particular, um, and then it becomes commodity. Now here, a lot of that, it doesn't happen in that organic way at first. It's like arts districts, and then people move there. I mean, of course, there are still people moving there before, but, but it's not, and, the, and it doesn't succeed in the same way. So you can have an institution like the Parkway, $20 million, or down the street, like the, the, the theater renovated for like the Micah and Johns Hopkins film program, or, um, uh, what are those, or Motor House, you know, that's like $6 million. Um, you know, you can have like uh, Graffiti Alley, right? It's like, and you have all these like photo shoots outside in Graffiti Alley, which is like graffiti sanctioned by the city, right? And um, to like have this idea of like this multicultural like um, consumption, essentially, right? And and so I'm not sure if this answers your question, but but these are some of the things that I noticed. I think in contrast to Seattle, in some ways, or even other cities that have lived, um, like um, San Francisco, or New York, or Boston, um, and and part of that is that. The toll of disinvestment, it's so like overarching. You know, it is the it is the central thing that is ongoing in the city, in my opinion, in many ways. And it can't be $20 million or a hundred million dollars or three hundred million dollars. It can't even change a neighborhood, right? And which in some ways there is a good side to that, right? But the bad side is even without changing it, right? The property values in the particular, like Station North, let's say, you know, Station North, like just the property taxes means that like black people who've lived in the neighborhood for generations can no longer afford their homes. And then the city confiscates it just because they can't pay 300, 500, $600 in their property taxes. And that's why, so all this whole web, like I think, like I became very conscious of, or like I was walking down Charles all the time, like, and also just the way that people do and do not deal with it, right? Like when I was moving here and I was like, oh, where should I live? Talking to a few people I know. And I'm, I'm like, I went somewhere I need to go on. I have to go on long walks like every day, at night. During the, they're like walks at night, you know? And I was like, yeah, you know, like walking around. They're like, oh no, we don't do that, you know? And, and I'm like, oh, well, what do you mean? Like, I was like, they're like, you know, so it was this idea that you couldn't walk around at night, you know, and it, that it's too dangerous, right? And that's a, you know, that's a Baltimore mentality. And, but I was walking around all over the place at night and it's not that it's not dangerous, right? But danger, you know, there's also the possibility for connection, right? And it's not, and it was, I mean, honestly, I, I in some ways, Baltimore is less, um, yeah, I guess that the honesty of being on the street, even when it, I think there are ways in which even when someone is essentially threatening you, like it, it can go in different directions, right? Sometimes that is part of being in a neighborhood, right? Like it's a familiarity and it's not, there are different kinds of threats, I guess I would say. And so, um, so yeah, I guess those are some of the things. <laughs> um, yes, question back there. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I moved to San Francisco when I was 19, and that was in um, 1992. And, you know, it felt like everyone was dying of AIDS and drug addiction and suicide. That's the world that I came up into, and that's what I grew up with. You know, um, if you were queer, that meant everyone was dying. And ACT UP was, you know, I joined when I was 19. Um, and it sort of formed some of my politics, especially around what now would be called intersectionality, but it was not what was, was you know, connecting 
um, race, class, gender, and sexuality. And specifically, you know, to, you know, to challenge um, the complicity of the U.S. government in the AIDS crisis, right? And um, and it was also that particular chapter. Now, all ACT UP chapters are not this way, but that was a chapter that operated by consensus. And so consensus also formed, you know, all of the organizing that I've done. And and I think it's an interesting question about anti-authoritarianism and because um, I think for me, it's just how I live. And I think in, in you know, like growing up, like, um, and, you know, people were calling me a faggot before I knew what it meant. So I was like, what's a faggot? You know, and I knew it was bad. I knew it was something about not performing masculinity, like adequately. But I didn't know that, you know, I was like, when I like, oh, there's a sexual dimension. I was like, oh, well, I guess that's true. But how do they know? Right. And, and so, like, I always knew that, you know, if I, I claimed that, right, that that meant that I was worthless, right? And that everything I did no longer had any value. And when I decided, oh, well, who cares, right? Like, turn it around. Then, to me, that always meant, like, challenging the violence that had, you know, created that worldview, right? So, so like, um, racism, classism, misogyny, homophobia, again, right? And, um, and so seeing the way that this more assimilated uh, which is it, it is exactly the same moment, right? It's like 93 is this like, don't ask, don't tell. It's like, oh, instead of fighting for universal health care, which was a central career issue, it's like, oh, fight for the right to kill, right? And so I think it, for me, queer has always been synonymous with rejecting all hierarchies and building something else in the ruins. And so, and in my writing, for me, I also, I don't believe in conventional narrative because I think conventional narrative imposes like this artificial construct in our lives that are not written like or, or don't not lived like that, I should say. And and so for me, I always start a book, and this book in particular, I started, I didn't know what I was writing. I knew I was writing about my relationship with Gladys, but I didn't know what that was gonna be. And so I just started by touching the art. And so for me, I think part of that is is about challenging like the the structures that will never actually describe our lives, right? And this idea of plot, you know, or like uh, resolution, right? These are so much work is destroyed by resolution, right? Like that doesn't happen. I mean, I would love it to happen, right? But like it makes most work, books, you know, it ruins them, right? And so for me in this book in particular, like it starts with my relationship with Gladys, you know, it starts with this moment of childhood possibility and then it continues um, with, Oh, I guess it's counting. <laughs> Someone's looking through the glass, and I was like, "What are they looking for?" But they're counting it. Okay, so we've been counted. Um, and um, yeah, and so for me, the structure comes through the writing itself, and I think that is like an anti-authoritarian way of thinking about writing. But for me, it's also just honesty, you know, and directness and feeling. And I think I'm writing toward all that. Like if I had just thought, okay, I'm only writing about my relationship with Gladys, or only writing about her art, a more typical biographical art, then I would have missed almost everything that matters, right? Like, and, um, or if I had thought, you know, any one of these elements, I'm like, oh, wait, this is not about my father sexually abusing me. Okay, I'll just keep that out, right? That would, again, a more typical biographical example, right? But like, so much of what is like made possible in the book is by talking about that, right? And also that's central to our relationship. You know, she raised him, right? Like she supported him, you know, when I confronted him about sexually abusing me, you know, like the rest of my family. And so that has to be in there, right? And like, similarly, if I was like, oh, well, this is interesting about gentrification in Baltimore or about how, you know, these arts districts, um, but that's not what I'm writing about. Then, then I would have lost that, right? Or even like I went to this Mark Bradford show at the Baltimore Museum of Art and, He's a gay black artist making abstract work now. And that art like blew me away. And so I start writing about it. And then when I'm writing about it, I'm like, I don't think this connects, but there's some, you know, connections in their work. They certainly never knew one another. Um, and then, you know, when I'm at the very end of writing the book, I realized that his show was called Tomorrow is Another Day. He's taking the last line of Bomb with the Wind to this work that's almost entirely abstract. 
you know, Gone with the Wind being this, you know, rationalization, modernization of slavery, right? And so he describes his book about, I mean, his art show is being about the failed project of reconstruction. And I was like, oh, that's what I'm writing about, right? So I didn't know that when I started it, right? But then I'm like, oh, and then that comes back into the picture. So then I'm like, oh, no, I know I was writing it, right? And so, so for me, writing is always that, that journey and that sort of um, questioning of everything, right? And also the, the, also the revealing of the contradiction and the layers and the failure, um, as well as the connection and the possibility and the, it's all together, right? It's all in the same space. Thank you. Great, one last question. I guess we'll have two, just since two people have one and other one. I'll try to be faster. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's a wonderful question. Yeah, it's true. I think I grew up, well, I think in, in, in two ways. So uh, because Gladys was an abstract artist, she really did see everything as art. At least that's how I interpreted it. So even though she also saw in this hierarchical way, you know, um, but I think that childhood thing stayed with me. So there's certain things, um, and I think that, uh, and yes, art was visual art, um, and especially abstract art, because she thought figurative art was derivative and, and worthless, essentially. So, um, and, Although some of her work was partially figurative, you know, but it was within the language of abstraction. Um, so I think for me over time, it's interesting because I don't know that I actually connected it, but I think that in, in writing the book, I realized that so much of how I think about writing is very similar to how she thought about making a painting, right? Like you start um, in some way, like, and, you know, you, the sort of organic sense of it, right? And um, I think that over time, I don't know, I guess I would say, if I had to think about it right in this moment, that actually that, that, that notion that art can be anything, that is what stayed with me. I still feel that way, you know? I think that the, the thing that has really developed over the years is like the industry of art, you know, I think is repulsive and destroys all the possibilities of creativity. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't go to a great show, though. So it's interesting. It's, they still exist alongside one another. But the commodification and um, the streamlining and the gatedness of it, like going to the Baltimore Museum of Art and like going in the sculpture garden, and there's one work that you're allowed to do in the sculpture garden. <laughs> like birds are sitting on it, squirrels are on it, you know, like there's a thunderstorm on it, there's leaves on it. But there's only one work you can touch. So that, that also comes to the book, right? This idea of what can you touch, touching you up. Um, so, so I think that, and so I guess that's maybe the other part of it. I think we should be able to touch it. You know? And that if we don't touch it, is it really touching us? I'm going to take this one last question. Sure, just ask, and then I'll see if I can answer quickly. And if not, we'll talk after. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think that's a huge topic in the book. And I think the way that I think about it is like as a child, like um, I grew up in a non-observant Jewish family, but I was given the choice to go to Hebrew school and I chose to go. And I really like loved the, you know, the culture and, and also the language. Like I didn't, this is without any context, you know? And uh, even though the language meaning, you know, I learned how to read it, but not what it meant, essentially, right? Because it's for prayer. And, um, and also the rituals, like, like you know, sort of um, raising money to plant trees in the Negev Desert, right? That's like something a lot of temples do, right? Now, I didn't know at the time that actually the money is being raised to plant over uh, destroyed Palestinian villages, right? It's, um, and... And then, but also like going to visit my relatives and like they would switch to Yiddish to say racist things about black people. And, and I thought, oh, that's what Yiddish is for. I didn't know the history of Yiddish, right? So it's like, so I feel like I always had this discomfort. Like when I, and when I was 13, after I had a bar mitzvah, I was like, I don't believe in God. Okay, I don't, want, I don't believe any of this, right? Now, of course, there's a long history of like Jewish um, atheists, but I didn't know that at the time, right? And so this is what you know as a child and then what you learn, right? And, um, and for me, in writing this book and understanding the history of Jewish assimilation in Baltimore really allowed me to understand my discomfort with my own family's sort of racism, classism, and the, uh, the myth of upward mobility. Like, upward mobility will solve everything. Like, you can sexually abuse your children and no one will ever know. Great, upward mobility, that's upward mobility. Now, I knew that violence because I grew up in it, you know, and my father's psychiatrist, you know. And what could be more? <laughs> and um, and so, but learning the history of Jewish assimilation in Baltimore um, helped me to understand that more. And so, just to give a few examples, which I, you know, I do talk about in the book, but like, like knowing that, like the first Jews in Baltimore were um, among the first Jews in Baltimore were British convicts who were sent here, like you know, seven years of servitude. So, but when they escaped, right, they were like, okay, get us, get us away, right? But then, you know, um, during the Civil War, when Baltimore was under Union occupation, there were Jewish merchants who were smuggling goods to the Confederacy, right? So, and, um, and Jews were overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, as well, you know, as well as all white people in Baltimore, overwhelmingly with close slavery, right? And um, so that legacy, right? And so, and this just goes on and on, right? Like, it's, so it's side by side, right? Like, you know, when the Jew bill gave Jews the same rights as white Christians, um, they made sure that it didn't apply to free black people, right? So, you know, and and then you have, you know, it continues to the day where you have like um, the path, like Jews couldn't own property in most of Baltimore, right? So just Northwest Baltimore and just a small section. And, and But as Jews became more mobile, they moved, right, in this direction. And the neighbors they left became black neighbors, right? But Jews, some still own the property, you know, a lot of it, and would rent at these exploitative rents to, to black people. So they were victims of white supremacy, but also beneficiaries. And I think that legacy continues to this day. You know, you can have like Joseph Myroff, like his name is on everything in Baltimore, the symphony, the, you know, it's like Myroff this, Myroff that. You know, he, um, you know, refused to rent property to black people and Jews. This is a Jew who's like, I'm not going to rent to Jews because I want to become part of the status quo, right? And so, and that's the, that, that legacy. And so I think we have to look at that legacy if we are going to look at Jewish radicalism or Jewish atheism or Jewish, you know, like alternatives to the status quo. They, you can't have one without the other, you know? So I think for me, and that's very central in the book and it, in a way that I didn't expect. Again, it was not something I thought of writing. It just happened through the book itself. So yeah, so thank you all for coming. Yeah, I'll be right here to sign. I also love hugs, so if anyone wants a hug, feel free to come up.